God, I pray that you would give her the, the words and encourage her. And Lord, I pray that through all the hard things in her life that she would be able to see today that there is fruit and that those hard things aren't being wasted. But Lord, that you're taking her through the hard things and you are filling her. You have made her new. And she is a daughter of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So let's welcome Jen as she shares her story. I'd like to start out with a prayer. Heavenly Father, please wrap your loving arms around everyone who's here. Please allow my words to reach at least one person, if not more. Please be here with us and give us all peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, in my childhood, as a child, I lived on a farm that was more like a commune. There was at least a total of 20 kids, and I was the oldest. I suffered severe abuse and neglect on, in my family, and I always thought I was the only one until years later. When I was nine, the state came and took me. I spent 14 months in Terrell State Hospital because, as the doctors termed it, my mind had fractured. I was diagnosed with PTSD and borderline personality disorder. Um, as a teenager, they put me in a series of foster homes and group homes because I ran away. There were 19 and I ran away from all of them. I think I was trying to go home because it's all I knew. When I was 13, I started doing drugs and drinking. I was trying to get away from my life and the drugs took me there. My mind was still fractured and most of the time I didn't know if I was coming or going. When I turned 18, I aged out of the system. They cut me loose. I didn't know how to take care of myself, much less anyone else. I would walk around hoping someone would say something wrong to me so I had a reason to fight. I ended up pregnant at 18 and had my daughter at 19. I was still doing drugs, so I gave her to my aunt to raise. About 18 months later, I had my son. This time I moved to St. Cloud to be near my bio mom so that she could help me. I didn't want to give up another child. There would be times that I would have the thought of doing to him what had been done to me and I would take him to my mom's. I knew he would be safe there. I'm still trying to forgive myself for that. When my son was 11, I went back to Texas. I got hooked on meth. I did that for two years, and there was a time that I overheard something I shouldn't have, and they tried to OD me. I was in ICU for three days, and my mom helped me get back up here to Minnesota. I put myself through treatment and started going to NA meetings. That was in 2006. I had five years clean and sober and I messed it up by starting to smoke weed again. I was going to school full time and working two part time jobs and I started failing my college classes. All this time I was still looking for someone to fight with. I would make a scene if things didn't go my way. I didn't care where I was. I could not seem to stop myself. I was always angry. I was convinced that the world owed me something because of what had happened. When I was 41, I met my ex, and that is also around the time that I started to think about getting help for my mental health. I was diagnosed with phobic social anxiety disorder and major depression. There were some doctors that thought I had bipolar as well, but I have never been tested for it. We were homeless in St. Cloud for two years, and that was when I saw my first counselor. I have been up and down over the years. Eventually, Chris's mom let us come to Pipestone to live with her. Soon after that, I got my apartment here on the high rise. 
I went on meds for my mental health and it seemed to work for a long time. What really turned it around was meeting Jess at Bread of Life. I started going to church with her and there was something there that I had never experienced before. Now I know that it was the Holy Spirit. I ran from it at first, but I couldn't forget the inner peace that I had every time I went. So I was baptized last summer and now I listen to the Bible every morning. I am proud to be a Christian and I strive every day to be worthy of Christ's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Love you, Dad. Love you too. There's one thing that's a whole lot better than me standing up here and preaching, and that's when you preach to each other and you share what God's been doing in your lives. And the reality of God at work in us day after day is so powerful to hear. So, Jen, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for all of you who shared what God's been doing uh, in your lives. And, uh, yeah, just absolutely incredible. So, thank you. And we're going to get to some food here really quick, but uh, just let me unpack a few things for you. Uh, so the message I'm just going to bring is basically to speak to the foundation behind why Jen and so many of us have had life-changing experiences when Christ has come into our lives. So along with myself and many others that are here, we can testify to the fact that we've experienced something very similar to what Jen shared. And though my story is different than Jen's, and your story might be more similar or less similar to what Jen shared, the reality that we know is that when Jesus Christ comes into our life, he changes everything. Amen. And I would say that when I was a younger guy, if I was a teenager and I thought about uh, or I listen to myself now, I would have thought, yeah, right. Yeah, that's just a preacher up there preaching words, saying things. But guys, now that I've had the experience, I can tell you he truly does change everything. Now, I want to say this. By saying that he changes everything, I'm not falling in to buying what some people think is the uh, health, wealth, and prosperity. When you come to Christ and you follow Christ, I'm not saying that all of a sudden life is just going to get easy and you're not going to have any struggles and all of a sudden your bank account's going to boost way up. That's not what I'm saying. But what I will tell you is this. When you take Christ as your Savior and you follow Him and you surrender yourself to Him, what you will have is joy. You will have hope. You will have peace. You will have courage. You will have direction. Jen, would you have had the courage to get up here? She, she was saying in her testimony even that she had this social anxiety. And yet here she is standing up before you, able to share what God has put on her heart because he has given her the strength to do so. You don't do that without Christ giving you that. And you will never be left alone. So though you may still struggle, you will never be alone in those struggles. And although there will be times when you are sad, you're going to have a deeper joy at the heart, at the core of who you are, to be able to walk through it knowing that God's got this. He's walking you through. You're also going to know that you have a purpose. You have a purpose and you have value. You are not an accident. And the things that you went through, Jen, were not a waste of time. God's using all those broken places and is healing them. And they're part of your story and they will always be part of your story. But he is showing you that you have value and you've got a purpose. And that is for all of us, guys. We have got a purpose. Your life does matter. Amen. And when you're with Christ, 
He is going to begin to show you that you have things that are in you that are going to come out that you didn't know even existed. You're going to face temptation still, but now you're going to know that your life has been redeemed, you're forgiven, and you have power to face those temptations. You're going to begin to see people through the eyes of Jesus as opposed to having eyes of envy or revenge or praying that they're going to lip off to you so that you can beat them up. You're going to see them with different eyes. And he will give you patience. And he will give you compassion in ways that you never knew could be. Death is going to lose its grip on you. It's not going to have this grip of fear over you. And while you still have battles with the old self, your new life is on a new trajectory. That's the Christian walk. That's what it is to walk with Christ. And where you once couldn't find anything to satisfy you, there was that deep longing for something more. You knew that there was something. There was an emptiness inside you. With Christ, you will be satisfied. You will know what it is to be fulfilled and to know that there is something more because you, you, you know what it's like to, to go after things or experiences and try and find fulfillment in those things and to still realize you're still hungry. You're still thirsty. At Cornerstone, we've been going through the book of John and I'm not going to go into the message this week very much except to say this. So we're in John chapter 6. The backstory is, is Jesus is with his disciples. They're on the Sea of Galilee on the edge. They're on the north east side of the Sea of Galilee. And this large crowd of like 12, 15,000 people showed up. They counted there were 5,000 men. And Jesus fed them miraculously bread and fish, and it was this big miracle. And then during the night, Jesus walks on water with his disciples. They go back across the Sea of Galilee. Galilee. Now they're on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, and people come searching for him. They find him, and Jesus says to them, he says, you, you've come looking for the bread. And they are. They're, they're looking for this. And there's two planes going on. There's what people are thinking. And then there was what Jesus is speaking about. Now what the people are looking for is, hey, that was some pretty good bread. I don't know if it was garlic bread or not, but it was good bread. And they're coming back looking for some more of this bread. And so Jesus says, you're coming looking for this bread. Well, and then in John chapter 6, he says this to them. John chapter 6, verse 27, he says, Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. And so the, the people say, okay, so we're not supposed to work for that bread. Well, how do we do the work of God? It says, what can we do to perform the works of God, they ask. And they're thinking, okay, I don't want to work for things that perish. I want to work for this eternal bread. Well, what must I do? And Jesus says in verse 29, he says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. In other words, he's saying the work of God, the thing that you need to do in order to earn this acceptance from God is actually not a work at all. You need to believe. You need to trust. It's not a work that you're going to accomplish. You put your faith in, in Jesus Christ. Then, of course, people are people. They say, well, what sign are you going to show us? And they start to talk about how Moses had the manna, and Jesus says this in verse 32. By the way, we'll go into this more next week. But Jesus says to them, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the real bread for he from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I'm going to jump all the way to verse 50. Jesus says this, this bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die, 
51, he says, I am the living bread that comes from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, we're going to talk about how they had a real problem with this because they're thinking on a very literal, they're thinking on a very literal plane. They're thinking his flesh, his blood, well, that's kind of disgusting. His, his flesh and his blood. But what we know is what this is about is Jesus dying on the cross, allowing his flesh to be broken, his blood to be poured out so that we can be forgiven, redeemed, purchased, sins wiped away, clean. Jen didn't do anything to save herself. Christ died on the cross so that she could be redeemed, purchased, forgiven. Those people you beat up, <laughs> you're forgiven. It's done. It's go now, she told Marnie and I, she said, I used to look for people that were just lip would lip off to me so I could get in a fight because I had so much anger and I just wanted to lash out. And she told us, she says, but not anymore. That's gone. That's Christ at work. Because when Christ forgives us, one of the big powerful things is that we are now able to forgive ourselves as well. Because we're able to recognize that although I am not yet who God is making me to become, I am no longer who I once was. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the gospel just very quickly wrapped up. Guys, God created you to be in relationship with him, to know him, to be united with him. But our sins had separated us from him. And we try and we try and we think, okay, if I'm just a good enough person, I can, I can earn my way to heaven. Well, no, you can't. Your sins cannot be paid off by your good deeds because you can never do enough good. Because I don't know about you, but I know myself. I'm a pastor, but you know what? As many good things as I do, I still sin. And I still need forgiveness. And I can't earn that. But Jesus bled and died on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And that's the foundation for why a transformation like Jen's is possible. And mine and many of yours. You know your story, don't you? And a lot of you here can testify and say, yep, I'm not who I once was. I am a new creation in Christ. Would you pray with me? And just, I want to say, if any of you out there don't know where what that's like yet, and if you just want to bring that before the Lord and to know and to have that kind of a transformation, you just pray to God right now and you just say in your own heart, this, this, guys, this is nothing magical. You just say, Lord, I'm trusting you. Change me like you changed them. Forgive me like you forgave them. I surrender to you, and I want my life to be yours. Father God, I pray right now as we come together as a group of people in this little community in Minnesota, whether we have a motorcycle up here from Texas or from Oatana or we're from around town and we just walked over to the, to the courthouse lawn today. Lord, you're meeting us here. And God, I know that your word says that nobody can be saved without being drawn in by your Holy Spirit, without being drawn in by the Father. And coming to Christ, nobody can, can experience that without that work being done. And Lord, I know for a fact that everybody here is being drawn in because they're here right now. And so, Lord, I know that your word will be spoken. Your word will be heard. Your Holy Spirit will stir hearts right now. And so, Father, I pray for each and every one of us. Some of us just need to say... I. I've walked away, Lord. Forgive me. Draw me back. Some of us have never been at this place. And for maybe the first time, realizing our need for you, Jesus Christ, help us to turn to you. Forgive us. And Father, for those of us who have been walking with you for a long time, Lord, I pray that you'll keep us humble. 
don't let us ever get to the place where we think that somehow, some way, we are self-righteously in a place of leadership. But Lord, we are desperately in need of you every moment of every day. Jesus, I thank you for being the bread of life. Lord, that you fill us on a plane spiritually where we never hunger again. And God, I know that there is nothing in this world that I need more than I need you. And Lord, I know in you there is joy and there is peace and there is contentment and there is courage and there is direction. Lord, we all need that. So we invite you here, and Lord, as we have fellowship time together today, and as we eat together, I pray that you would be glorified. In your name we pray, amen. I'm going to ask Paul Vandevoort to come up and pray for our meal, and then we're going to have one more song. So worship team, you can come up, and then, uh, and then we're going to dismiss for lunch. Shortest message Steve Stahl has ever preached. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So, do we serve a great God or not? Amen. And how about His grace? Amen. We're very thankful and joyful that you could join us today. And for those of you who are around next week, join us in the CRC for worship again at 1030. And we'll enjoy uh, our fellowship together. And there should be enough food for everybody. So, kids have to go last. <laughs> anyway, we're certainly glad you came. And the little white church on the table back there is for our regular attenders to give their offering or prayer requests. And the rest of you who are guests, uh, we don't expect you to contribute to that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for a God who knows everything, who's everywhere present, but yet you're right here with us. You know each one that you have created. And we thank you again for the freedom we enjoy. We thank you for the food we're about to eat. And we pray that we would give you praise in the coming days for all you deserve. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I...
Father, what a beautiful service and what a way to end it. How great thou art. We don't deserve it. We've done nothing for it, but you've given it. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for salvation. And I pray that if there's anyone in this tent or outside of this tent who doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, this would be the day. And what a day it would be to remember. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name.